Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The records reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and the prosecutors are present as well. And we're outside the presence of the jury. And Dr. Greer, you're welcome to sit there. Uh, but this is probably going to take a little bit, um, so you can step down if you like, whatever you wish, okay? All right. This is uh, with respect to um, Defense Exhibit D-TR-97, which is a video recording um, taken by two defense investigators of the defendant while the defendant was in the hospital, in a hospital bed, on Monday, November 19, 2012. Uh, and the video recording is about 25 minutes long, maybe a little bit shorter than that, but uh, it is an interview of the defendant by uh, mostly one of the investigators, although I think the other investigator may ask a question or two. It's hard to, hard to tell. Um, and um, they're uh, asking the defendant how he's doing, how he's feeling, um, and then at some point, um, they asked the defendant about the night before and to talk about the night before. And the defendant uh, talks about shadows, seeing shadows and hiding from shadows, hiding under the blankets uh, from the shadows. Uh, and he talks about the shadows being um, present even under the blankets. I think he says that he's frightened of the uh, shadows, that the shadows poke him and pick him up and do things to him. Um, and then um, there's some detailed discussion of these shadows and then from there it's some more small talk about uh, how he's doing. Uh, I think there's small talk about the Broncos and the Chargers who played apparently the day before. Um, whether he needs anything, I think at one point um, they ask if he needs, uh, he wants some water, they give him some water. Uh, and I think toward the end of the interview uh, they ask if, if they can um, I think one of the investigators mentions that the defendant's lips seem uh, dry and, and so the defendant asks for, I think, some kind of lip balm and, and the investigator indicates that he will talk to the nurse about that as well as about getting eye drops because the defendant indicates that his eyes feel sandpapery and, and so they indicate to him that they will let the um, nurse know about that and see what they can do. Uh, in general, I would describe the defendant's demeanor as groggy, um, sleepy, um, he appears to barely be able to keep his eyes open. He is coherent in general and he's able to carry out, carry on a conversation um, and um, appears to understand the questions that, that are asked and appears to respond to the questions appropriately, uh, but he seems to be, uh, as I said, groggy, sleepy, perhaps under the influence of drugs, uh, at least that's the appearance, and that's based on my observations. It appears that he may be under the influence of some drug or something, and he seems really uh, almost, um, at least partially out of it, not quite alert, if you will. So. The question is whether to allow the video recording under Rule 703. Rule 703 says that if, a, if of a type reasonably relied upon by experts in the particular field, informing opinions or inferences upon the subject, the facts or data need not be admissible in evidence in order for the opinion or inference to be admitted. Facts or data that are otherwise inadmissible shall not be disclosed to the jury by the proponent of the opinion or inference unless the court determines that their probative value in assisting the jury to evaluate the expert's opinion substantially outweighs their prejudicial effect. 
that's not the rule in its entirety, but that's the portion of the rule that's relevant to this particular issue. So Rule 703, for our purposes, provides that the facts or data on which an expert bases an opinion need not be admissible as evidence for the opinion to be admitted so long as the facts or data are of a type reasonably relied upon by experts in the particular field. However, the rule states that if such facts or data are themselves inadmissible, then they cannot be disclosed to the jury by the proponent unless the court determines that their probative value in assisting the jury to evaluate the expert's opinion substantially outweighs their prejudicial effect. And I have watched exhibit um, D-TR-97 twice now, and I have ruled that it is inadmissible. So I'm not going to repeat why I found it inadmissible, but I sustain the prosecution's objection to hearsay, um, and frankly, I don't know that it would pass muster under Rule 403. If, if I had to decide admissibility under Rule 403, I don't believe it would uh, pass muster under that rule. But the question right now is whether it can be admitted under Rule 703. Um, rule 703, although, although it allows a party to disclose to the jury facts or data that are otherwise inadmissible in some circumstances, it cannot be used to undermine the other rules of evidence or to simply get around the other rules of evidence. Um, and I think that's the argument that Mr. Brockler made at the bench yesterday, that um, the defense appears to be using Rule 703 to get in evidence that I have ruled is inadmissible. Now, um, I, I agree with Mr. Brockler, but I will say in all fairness that I said that I would entertain a request by the defense once Dr. Gurr testified uh, for uh, admission of this exhibit under Rule 703. And then I said we will see at that point whether the defense can establish the required foundation and we'll go from there. And I'm finding now that um, the, the foundation cannot be established and that furthermore the uh, exhibit is not admitted pursuant to the balancing test in the last sentence of the rule or the balancing test that's mentioned in the last sentence of, of the rule. Um, rule 703 uh, does not uh, permit otherwise inadmissible facts or data merely because an expert relied on, on them. Um, there's more to it than that. And there's a foundational requirement and then there's the requirement of the balancing test as well. And so let me address each of those two aspects. First, in terms of foundation, as far as I know, and this is based on my understanding of the comments that were made during the bench conference that we had yesterday in the afternoon uh, between Mr. Brockler, Mr. King, and the court. If I'm wrong, I'm sure the parties will correct me, and I, I would appreciate being corrected, but as far as I know, uh, no expert uh, discussed the video recording specifically in his or her report. Um, the video may have been listed as an item that was reviewed, but I don't believe that it's been discussed uh, specifically in any report from any expert in this case. Certainly, neither court-appointed expert discussed it or its contents. I went back and looked at the report from Dr. Reed and the report from Dr. Metzner, and as far as I can tell, neither one of them uh, discussed the um, video recording or the contents of the video recording. They listed it as something that was forwarded to them and something that they reviewed, but I didn't see any discussion at all of the video recording or any mention of it other than the fact that it was something forwarded to them and something that they reviewed. Additionally, and again, this is based on my recollection, and um, I'm far from infallible, so this is just the best of my recollection. Other than Dr. Gurr yesterday, no expert has testified that he or she relied on this specific video recording informing his or her opinions. Experts have talked about relying on everything that was, uh, in general, they've reviewed or all kinds of things that they've reviewed, but I don't recall anyone um, identifying this specific exhibit or singling out this specific exhibit as a basis for his or her opinion. 
Uh, nor has any expert, again to the best of my recollection, other than Dr. Gurr, testified that the video recording is of a type that's reasonably relied, reasonably relied on by experts in their field. Uh, and I note that the attorneys on both sides have had plenty of opportunity to ask each expert, other than Dr. Gurr, of course, uh, each expert about the video recording, whether it's something they relied on informing their opinions and whether, and whether it's something reasonably relied on by experts in their field, and none of the attorneys did so, at least based on my recollection. And neither party uh, attempted to establish the foundation required under Rule 703 for this video recording with any expert other than Dr. Gurr. And when I said a moment ago that each attorney has had plenty, or the attorneys have had uh, plenty of opportunity to ask each expert about this other than Dr. Gurr, I did not mean to imply that they haven't had that opportunity with respect to Dr. Gurr. Uh, the point is that uh, Dr. Gurr is the one, the only one that I believe has um, been asked about this, and that was yesterday by the defense. Um, I understand and acknowledge that all the experts have received and reviewed the video recording. Uh, at least that's my belief. Uh, I don't know about Dr. Woodcock, but I know for sure Dr. Reed and Dr. Metzner uh, re received it, and I think they said that they reviewed it, although I'm not 100% sure if they reviewed it or not, but I know they received it. Um, but that's not the same as relying on it for uh, forming an opinion or to form an opinion. Uh, the experts in this case, have reviewed tens of thousands of pages of materials and tons of CDs and DVDs. And the fact that they've reviewed these extensive voluminous materials uh, because counsel have forwarded them does not mean that their opinions are based on every single page or every single part of the materials. Uh, I note that yesterday Dr. Gurr only mentioned the video recording uh, at the end of her testimony uh, when asked about uh, asked by counsel on direct examination if she had relied on it informing her opinions in this case and whether it is the type of material reasonably relied on by other experts in the field or by experts in her field. Um, at least my recollection is that in rendering her actual opinions here in court yesterday she did not discuss in any detail the time that the defendant spent at Denver Health Medical Center. In fact, I don't remember if she even mentioned that hospital session in her direct examination testimony. If she did, then the record will reflect that and I'm wrong, but I don't recall this being a big part of her direct examination or a big part of her opinions that were rendered here yesterday. Regardless, the rule implicitly requires that the information be viewed as reliable by some independent objective standard beyond the opinion of the individual witness. That's from TK-7 Corp. Corporation versus Estate of Barbuti, B-A-R-B-O-U-T-I, 993 Federal 2nd 722, that's a 10th Circuit um, Court of Appeals case from 1993, which relied on Weinstein's federal evidence uh, in interpreting Federal Rule 703, which I believe is identical to CRE 703. That's the Colorado version of the rule. Um, and that type of implicit requirement is missing here. All we have is Dr. Gurr saying that she thinks this is the type of material that would be, that is reliable uh, for an expert um, in her field. So th the first part is the foundation. It's not there. And so not, the, the foundation that's required has not been established in my view. Uh, even taking Dr. Gurr's testimony at face value uh, that she reviewed this video recording, that she relied on it to form her opinions, and that at least she thinks that uh, this is the type of thing that other experts in the field would rely on, uh, I find that um, based on um, the record before me that that's not sufficient to establish the foundation that's required by Rule 703. And I, I, um, I might feel differently and I might um, be more persuaded by Dr. Gurr's testimony if any other expert had agreed with her or had said something along the lines of 
this is the type of thing that experts in that field, the field of psychiatry or the field of uh, neurology or neuropsychiatry, any of those fields uh, reasonably relies on or is justified in relying on. But just her saying it um, is not persuasive to me and not sufficiently credible given the record before me. Uh, <clears throat> the second part is a balancing test, and that is I have to look at the probative value of the exhibit in assisting the jury to evaluate Dr. Gurr's opinions and then compare that to the prejudicial effect. And the rule doesn't say um, prejudicial effect on what or on whom, it just says prejudicial effect. Um, but in this case, uh, I don't believe that the probative value in assisting the jury to evaluate Dr. Gurr's opinion opinions substantially outweighs the prejudicial effect. And, and I'll tell you what I, how I interpret uh, prejudicial effect here in a moment. But first, let me talk about the probative value. In, in terms of the probative value to assist the jury uh, to assess Dr. Gurr's opinions, certainly the jury does not need to watch the video recording to evaluate her opinions. As I mentioned, she did not refer to the interview, as far as I remember, or the contents of the interview uh, during her direct examination yesterday until the end when she was asked about um, uh, the recording and whether she relied on it. But I don't remember that being a big part of her testimony or her opinions. Uh, further, I infer from the record that the attorneys in this case agreed that the video recording did not have probative value in assisting the jury to evaluate other experts' opinions. Otherwise, they presumably would have attempted to lay the necessary foundation under Rule 703 when each witness testified and would have asked me to admit the video recording so that the jury could assess, properly assess, their opinions. That did not happen with any expert who has already finished testifying. Again, that's based on my recollection, and if, if I'm incorrect, I'm sure the attorneys will correct me. The, the second aspect, then, is prejudicial effect. And the rule says that the probative value has to substantially outweigh the prejudicial effect. So it's not enough if, if it just outweighs it, like 51% versus 49%, for example. It has to be, it has to substantially outweigh the prejudicial effect. And so I, I am mindful of that. This exhibit is essentially a testimonial interview of the defendant by his investigators. It's, it's what it is. Uh, I have allowed experts to talk about their interviews of the defendant, including Dr. Reed's video recorded interview of the defendant, but those are different. Those are sanity uh, examination interviews. Uh, this uh, exhibit, exhibit D-TR-97, is an interview by two investigators uh, from the public defender's office. They're asking the defendant to describe for them um, what happened the night before or what he experienced the night before. It's a testimonial interview. Uh, and then the defendant goes into what happened the night before in terms of the shadows, in terms of hiding from the shadows. And then, as I said, there's some other small talk in there. And then there's some um, part of the interview that's uh, related to how the defendant is doing and how the restraints are off of him now and how he likes that better, how he seems better, that kind of thing. Uh, this is different, in my view, than even the writings of the defendant at the jail. Um, I, I admitted those, but I see this as very different. And it's possible that I may have felt differently about this video recording uh, if it were simply a video recording documenting the defendant's hospitalization. So if there had been a camera, for example, in the hospital room recording everything, um, I might have felt differently. And my understanding is there is a surveillance video that's been admitted of the defendant while he was at the hospital. But uh, if this was a camera that included sound and was simply recording at all times everything that was happening, perhaps I would feel differently. But this is a question-answer session conducted by two investigators who work for the defendant, who are working on the defendant's case. Um, if, if I allow, um, you know, I, I may even have felt differently now that I think about it. It's possible 
that I may have felt differently about this video recording if it was one of the uh, investigators simply recording, video recording, an interaction between doctors and the defendant as doctors are asking him questions for medical purposes or tending to him. Uh, even that possibly might have been different for me. But that, again, is not what this is. This is an interview uh, of a testimonial nature by the investigators on the defense team uh, of the defendant. If I allow the recording, the prosecution uh, would not, will not have the opportunity to cross-examine the defendant about it, unless the defendant chooses to take the witness stand. But then it, it will be up to the defendant. Uh, in fact, the prosecution would not only be deprived of the opportunity to cross-examine uh, on this interview, this question-answer session uh, by the investigators, uh, but they uh, weren't present during the interview. I'm not saying they had the right to be present, but the point is they weren't present during the interview. This was, um, this was an interview that uh, was conducted um, with... Um, I think on November 16, which is a Friday, actually on November 19, which is a Monday, excuse me, uh, and the defense asked for permission from the court to bring a camera to the hospital. Uh, that was through uh, motion D-22, an ex parte motion that was signed by a judge other than Judge Sylvester, uh, because Judge Sylvester was on vacation, I believe, and, um, and, and the order says that the defense has or is permitted to videotape the defendant one hour per day. So, I, I have no way of knowing um, if there was any other recording performed, and this exhibit is a selection among the recordings, and of course it would be improper for me to ask defense counsel about that because that's attorney work product. Uh, in the video recording, uh, as I said, the defendant appears groggy and under the influence. He's generally coherent, but he's clearly groggy and sleepy. I don't know what, if anything, was said to the defendant before the interview in terms of an explanation for the video recording. Uh, and, and I don't know whether anything was said at all or an explanation was given. I, I know from um, the video recording that there's no discussion with the defendant as to why he's being video recorded or why the investigators are recording this. And the defendant doesn't ask, hey, why did you bring the camera in here? Or why do you guys have a camera? Or why are you recording me? Um, so I don't know if anything was said beforehand, and if so, what was said beforehand. Um, the defendant is coherent enough to be aware of the pending court proceedings because he specifically asks the investigators about that. Uh, and there's very small talk about that. Um, there has been a lot of testimony from Denver Health Medical Center medical staff in this trial. And I have admitted medical records from at least two doctors at DHMC related to the psychiatric treatment provided to the defendant at the hospital in November of 2012. Some of those records, I believe, mentioned that the defendant said that he was hiding under the covers because of the shadows that he was seeing. To the extent that the video recording mentions that as well, it is cumulative. To the extent that the defendant is asked by his investigators to elaborate on that and to, and to provide more details, or to the extent that the defendant provides more details, then I'm not aware that any of those details are contained in the medical records from DHMC. And again, if I'm wrong, counsel, please correct me at the end of this. I don't recall that in any of the medical records. I know that Dr. Metzner specifically mentions in his report the statement the defendant made, I think it was to Dr. Weintraub, about hiding under the covers because of the shadows. But I don't believe that the medical records from either Dr. Weintraub or anyone else go beyond that and talk about some of the other details that the defendant provides in this particular interview. If, if I'm right about that, and, and, and by the way, I don't remember any other part of the record containing those details. Again, if I'm wrong, then please correct me, but I, I believe this is the only place where there is this discussion. If, if I'm right about that, then these detail, more detailed statements about the shadows poking him and picking him up and doing things would be um, at least arguably inconsistent 
with the medical records at the HMC and perhaps the trial record. Um, I know that I checked um, Dr. Reed's report. Uh, actually, it was Dr. Reed's transcript. And there's conversation in that interview that Dr. Reed did of the defendant about shadows. And he doesn't mention those specific or more detail, more detailed statements. And in fact, he says that he's not, I, I think, to paraphrase, the way I understood that um, interview is that he was not scared of them and that he, he could summon them when he wanted to. That's different than what this video recording contains. Um, so that's something that I, that I take into account as well. And those are the defendant's own statements to Dr. Reed about shadows. Um, the reliability of the statements given, uh, especially given the condition of the defendant, especially given that this is a, um, an interview conducted or an examination conducted by just the investigators for the defense without an opportunity for cross-examination uh, is of concern to me. Um, the fact that the medical records at DHMC uh, are inconsistent with the more detailed statements in the video recording is of concern to me because the defendant is at DHMC to get uh, treatment and he's being treated by the psychiatric unit of the hospital and there are multiple people tending to him. We've heard from uh, several people who have come in here and have talked about how they were monitoring him closely they were asking him questions about what he was experiencing. Uh, they were making observations in the medical records about what he was saying, uh, what he was doing, uh, his demeanor, his behavior, all those things. And here we have an interview during the very same time frame at Denver Health Medical Center by the defense team uh, without any medical personnel present, without anyone else present, uh, that appears to have different information than the medical records which were generated at the same time. I mean, just during the same time frame, during the same hospitalization. So that too is a concern for me. Um, and finally, a concern I have is that this video recording contains not only the statements of the defendant, but it contains statements by the investigators. And uh, there are some observations that the investigators are making as they're questioning the defendant. Some of those observations are just in the way of observations, and some of them are included within the questions that they are directing at the defendant. That, too, is a concern for me in terms of this uh, video recording being admitted under Rule 703. So, for all those reasons, I find that the probative value of the video recording in assisting the jury assess or evaluate Dr. Gerr's opinions uh, does not substantially outweigh the prejudicial effect. Um, and I also find that this is problematic, as I said, under Rule 403, this exhibit is problematic under Rule 403. All right, anything uh, with respect to that? I'm, I'll have the people go first since it was your objection, Mr. Brockler. Anything on behalf of the people? No, sir, thank you. All right, the defense, Mr. King. Anything on behalf of the defense? One minute, Charlie, please. All right. Take your time. Your Honor, that was um, a lot to take in. Would you mind if, if we um, giving us an opportunity to, to respond uh, at the end of the day or early tomorrow morning. That, that's fine. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. And, and like I said, I'm doing my best based on my recollection. Uh, and, you know, if I'm wrong, then, you know, please correct me. But that's the best of my recollection. So, all right, let's uh, bring the jury in, please.
Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom now. Welcome back, folks. I hope you had a good lunch. Yes. Great. All right. Uh, Dr. Gurr, you're still under oath. And Mr. Brockler, you may proceed with the rest of your cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, doctor, we had uh, finished by talking about one of the quotes that you had attributed to the defendant in your report. Do you recall that? Yes. I want to move on to another one. Okay. Um, also from that December 19th, 2012 time period, there is a um, sentence that follows the one that you uh, quoted about um, death was one option, getting captured was the other. Do you remember that? That next sentence says, he stated that he had a mission, comma, quote, an awakening, comma, I had to do it, comma, I must do it now, end quote. Do you see that? I don't see it, but I recall it. Yeah. Let me. Okay. Should be right after that part we just talked about in your report. Ma'am, uh, doctor, b bottom of page eight of your report, and I mean very bottom of page eight. Yes, thank Found you. It. Thank you. Okay, good. So uh, the question was, you recall writing in there, he stated that he had a mission, comma, quote, an awakening, comma, I had to do it, comma, I must do it now, end quote. You remember that? Yes. And the parts that are in quotes are what he said and how he said it. Is that fair? Yes. What is not in quotes is the word omission. 
he had a mission. Do you see that? It's right before the quoted part, an awakening. Yes. Now, that's not in quotes because that's not the word that he chose, right? He used the word mission frequently, and it might be that I omitted putting it in quote then, or I added the word uh, mission because it's a word that he used before. One of the things that you'd agree with is in reviewing all of the writings of the defendant, uh, including the notebook and the jail writings after his arrest, the um, G-chats, the texts, the emails, everything, that prior to this exchange, the defendant never uses the word mission. You'd agree with that? Yes. Now, in this particular case, looking at your notes, not the report, it appears from your notes that you are the first person to inject the word mission into the conversation through a question. Do you see that? Judge, I'm going to object to the, to the, um, to the question, the phrasing of the question. Sustain. Rephrase your question. Thank you. Do you take a look at your notes. It looks like you are the first person to use the word mission in this conversation with the defendant in December of 2012. And I'm going to refer you to what I think is the first use of it, and you tell me if you see that. It says, I asked if his mission was accomplished. He said, no. And no is in quotes. You see that? Yes, but I believe that I was repeating the word that he said, and that I was not creating the word. He was talking about a mission, something that he had to accomplish. Okay, a couple of things. You'd agree that you didn't write that in your notes as he said it, nor did you attribute any quotations around it. You'd agree with that? Yes. Okay. Let's move on to the next part of that phrase, which is uh, an awakening. I had to do it. I must do it now. Do you see that? Yes. An awakening sounds pretty unique, doesn't it? Yes. And did he tell you what he meant by an awakening? Because it's not in there. A call for action, something that needs to be done. But an awakening from what? From his, sta from his sta state of uh, despair, believe that the world is coming to an end, there's nothing to be done, I will never be a neuroscientist, a movement, something that will move him forward. And this is something that you wrote down in your June 2013 report, correct? June. Do we have a page number, Your Honor? June. Still the bottom of page. You're meaning the f June. This is your I June. I don't. This is your you, June. You mean in my notes, not in, in my June? Ma'am, yes. The, the report that we're referring to where you put down this quote, an awakening and the rest of it, that report was generated in June 2000. Ah, the first report. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Now, I want you to go back to the notes that you generated in December of 2012, some six months before this. Do you have those in front of you? Yes. Again, I, I, uh, it may be in there. I don't read your handwriting well, but can you please find us where you write down that quote, an awakening? I do not have the quote in my notes. And you didn't write it down at the time, correct? Correct. So six months after the interview, and several interviews afterwards, you, as you sat down to write this, you recalled this exchange? Yes, yeah, several of the words that he's been using were quite unique, such as awakening, master power, uh, call for action, and I remembered them. Not unique enough to write down at the time. Fair? Didn't consider writing it down within the limitation of the time available. Limitation of time? Who put a limitation of time on you? You know, the travel, how many hours do I have after that to summarize it and get back? So, so you, it was just sort of a self-imposed travel limitation? Part of it, yes. Okay. Now, you certainly had the opportunity to review these notes before you wrote the report in June, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, when he says to you, I had to do it, I must do it now, does he clarify for you what now meant? 
mean, did he mean March, April, May, June, July? What was now? Now means more getting ready. There was not, not no specific date provided, but it's something that need to be acted upon in the upcoming future. There was no date. Well, later on, uh, I think the next page, he then tells you that when he reached the conclusion that he must follow the call for action, he began to order the weapons. Do you see that? On page 10? I hope it's 9, but it could be 10. Page 9? Yeah, let me take a look. Ma'am, the section ends with only way to get out of being immobilized. It was a call for action. When he reached the conclusion that he must follow the call for action, and I'm sorry, I cut and pasted it into my notes, so I don't yeah, have I'm, I'm looking for it, yes, please. Yes, I'm there. It's the last uh, line before visit to February 9th morning, 2013. Great. Thank you for finding that. So it's just at the top of the next page. Is that right? Correct. Now, that indicates that when he began to order the weapons was about the time he felt the call for action. Do you agree with that? At the call for action came a little bit before it was not like he didn't care at one day, he was struggling, but when he realized that this is a mission that has to be pursued, he began with to purchase the, the weapon. So this is later on in, uh, it's not day, you know, it's not like a specific day to day, it's more like toward, uh, later on in the spring. So if we were to know when he started ordering the weapons, we could determine that it was prior to that that he felt this, felt this compulsion? Correct. Do you remember when he attempted to make the first weapon purchase? I believe that the first weapon merch, uh, was not successful and he purchased the Glocker in, uh, begin in May of 2012. What about the cell phone stun gun and the folding knife that he was going to use for serial killing? I believe that he had it before. Do you, of that. do you remember when he purchased that? I don't remember the date. Based on your understanding of what you've written in your report, would that, quote, call for action have occurred prior to the cell phone stun gun and the folding knife? It was a repeated call. It wasn't something that occurred just one time, but it's something that was happening continuously, uh, mobil getting mobilized to do something. So I cannot tell you if there was a specific day or time before the, the, the call and then he got it. It was a, over a period of several weeks that this was evolving. I understand, but I just want to be clear. That call for action, whenever it started, it would have been prior to the cell phone stun gun and the folding knife. Is that your recollection? Part of it, yes. Oh, okay. Let's go to your February 9th morning meeting with him. Yes. Now you indicate in there that um, he felt that shooting others, quote, 
can rid them of their problems and put them out of their misery, period, end quote. You, you see that? Yes. Now, one of the things that's important about that is it looks like he thinks he's doing a favor to the people that he's shooting. Is that fair? He didn't put it as a favor, but as an, uh, more of as an explanation of a part of life is not worthwhile for me, it is no value, death equals life, and uh, it is, didn't think that it is value for other people as well, and that they will not be, all people do not feel, all people suffer, life is meaningless for other people as well. So taking life of other people will put them off the misery. And, and you'd agree with me, putting someone out of their misery is doing them a favor? It can be interpreted this way, yes. Can you mm -hmm. find an interpretation of it that's not a favor? <coughs> no, I'll, 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 I agree that it will go more as something than doing something. Now, but you go ahead. I'm sorry, doctor. Go no, ahead, go ahead. So I was going to ask you, though, that you put that in quotes because those are the exact words that he used, correct? Yes. Now, I want you to go to your notes from that February the 9th, 2013, and you use slightly different language for what he told you. Do you agree? Since he can't do that, shooting others can put them out of the problems too. So, to be fair, you changed the words problems to misery from February to your report in June. Is that fair? I believe that on father probing on that, he used the word misery as well. And again, of course, clearly not documented in your notes. There's other points that are not documented in my notes. There was no writing of line by line. But problem and misery are similar. Similar enough to not document that he added that change later after you probed him further on that. Fair? Correct. I did not document all the probing. Now, there is a next section here where you say, when he began to get the weapons, he thought he was acting in self-defense and got protective clothing. Do you see that? Yes. Now, describe that to me. What, what did he mean there? I presume you did some that further undocumented when I asked, When I asked him about the first weapon that he obtained, he said that he got the gun for self-protection. From what? From potential intruders. That was the explanation that he gave me, that uh, uh, Hillary had her uh, screen uh, cut and that it needs to be uh, protected. So, so just, just to be accurate, yeah. first off, none of that appears in your notes or your report. You'd agree with that? Correct. But your recollection is, these many months later, is that the defendant told you that he bought the gun because Hillary's screen had been cut at her apartment. Is that in, right? In response to my questions when he said, I bought the gun and he showed it to a friend, he showed the gun to a friend, why did you get this gun? For self-protection. And I asked, was there any crime in the environment? Do you live in an area where there's a lot of crime that requires protection? And he said that Hillary screen, this was his explanation to that. And you remember that independent of any notes or, or report from a couple years ago? There is also, I believe, a, 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 a note a, on a, the discussion from Hillary in email about a, a screen being a cut. Your recollection is her, she puts in that text message and that people... There is some, in some of the correspondence between them, is that uh, there is something that relates to her screen, to the best of my recollection, that this is something that she went through. It, Was it, this a motivation for him to get the gun? I doubt it, well, but that's what he said, and I report what he's saying. I, I want to read to you the phrase, okay? Yes. Because the Hillary part isn't in there. He thought he was acting in self-defense and got protective clothing. 
That's all one phrase. Agreed? Correct. Did he get the protective clothing also for the screen being cut? No, no. So it might be that the sentence is too condensed, and I'm sorry, or that my style of writing might not be uh, up to par, but the f he got the first gun for, first dis uh, for self defense with Hillary mentioned, with me probing Hillary uh, experience from what I recall mentioned at the time. I then proceeded to ask him about other things that he has purchased, and uh, for example, the self protecting clothes, and this was for protecting himself, from protecting himself down the road as he was uh, to accomplish uh, his mission. And again, none of that appears in your report or your notes, correct? That's what I, you know, my report uh, uh, meant. He did not get the protective clothes uh, mm -hmm. to protect himself from potential uh, intruders, but to protect himself during the time of the shooting. Well, and, and what, the way you've written it here doesn't have anything to do with intruders. It's just he thought he was acting in self-defense and got protective clothing. Fair? So I'm, what I'm providing, as I've done before, yes. is more detail that will put the sentence into context. His gear was not for, intrud for intruders. The gear, as I don't believe that the first gun was for intruders, I don't take his word for it. We examine it further. It was part of the process of obtaining weapons. The gear was part of, of the, you know, the process that he was going through to accomplish the mission. Well, while we're there, in February of 2013, did you have an exchange with him about why he thought he needed uh, body armor head to toe for the favor he was going to do for those in misery? To protect himself. From who? In, not from the people that he, he shot, but from uh, potential from police. Is that what he told you? That he bought the body armor to protect for, himself for his, from For his own protection, yes. Did he tell you from police? I don't remember if he said the word police or law enforcement, but yes, to protect himself. And he, why would he think the police would want to shoot him for doing these people a favor? Objection calls for speculation. Um, doctor, you can't speculate, but this question, I believe, is going at what he said to you. Yeah. Is that right? That's, yes, sir. Thanks. Right. And, and I can, can rephrase can, that. Please. What did he tell you was the reason he thought the police would want to shoot him? I mean, he was going as part of his mission to shoot people. And there were two possibilities. The possibility that he will get killed, that he will be shot at during that time, or he will be captured. So the self-protection, the, se the gear was to protect himself in case he shot. I, my question, I, I suppose, and I don't mean it to be difficult, it, it feels obvious, is did you ask him why he thought he would either be shot and killed or captured for doing this favor for the people in the theater? It was not a... It was not... I mean, you put it in as a rational thought. I'm doing people a favor as if it's a, a rational act to kill people for a favor. This is part of his delusions. He did not think that he will stand, I mean, I don't think, that he will stand with the police and negotiate and say, don't shoot me, I just, you know, these people are, uh, I'm doing them a favor. It does, didn't work like that in his delusional system. But so it sounds like he doesn't tell you why he bought armor anticipating that he would be shot or captured by members of society called police officers, right? No, he did. I mean, I did say that I, I'm not sure if he said the word security forces or if he said police, but he was aware and prepared himself 
to be killed. And, so, and, and let's just take that one step further. Based on your conversations with him, even back in February of 2013, mm -hmm. he knew that those people would perceive his actions as wrong and worthy of killing him or stopping him, right? Objection calls for speculation. Oh, overruled. He said based on your... Um, that they speak... Hold on, hold on, hold on. He's, the question was uh, based on your conversations with him. So it's calling for what he said, so the objection is overruled. Go ahead, doctor. That he, he knew that what he was doing was illegal, but he did not, in his state of mind, he did not have the capacity to distinguish between right and wrong and appreciate that with society morals, the act that he is doing is perceived as wrong. He did not go through this thought process that determines that he did not. He did not have the capacity to do that. You'd agree that he, he knew, really without a doubt, that certainly police officers would think what he was doing was wrong and worthy of shooting him for doing it. Was illegal. But you understand my question. Did you understand my question? No. That he believed that police officers would view what he was doing as wrong and try to shoot him or capture him to keep him from doing it. You agree with that? Objection calls for speculation. Overruled. Go ahead, he, doctor. He knew it was illegal and that police officers will shoot him for committing this act. But I do not infer from that that he was at that time at a state of mind distinguishing right from wrong. Doctor, and I didn't ask you those questions. You understand my question was about what he conveyed to you about believing police officers would try to shoot him or stop him for what he was about to do, right? Yes, the police officers, yes. You'd agree with me that speeding down the road is also illegal, correct? Yes. And uh, n nobody would expect that the police would try to shoot them for speeding down the road, correct? Objection calls for speculation. Sustain. Rephrase your question. Doctor, do you think that people would conclude that any police contact where they're breaking the law would result in their potentially being shot? Objection calls for speculation. Um, rephrase in terms of people. How about this? Uh, and I'll shift gears. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, doctor, it's not like he said, I needed this body armor to protect me from the crowd of people in the theater I was going to shoot. It's not like that, right? Correct. He only needed it for the police, correct? Is that right? Yes. He didn't need it to look ominous or imposing so 400 people didn't rush him and try to stop him from murdering them, right? Objection. Calls for speculation. Once again, Doctor, you should um, answer the question only based on what he said to you, the defendant said to you, not, he, not based on speculation. He did not say that he obtained the protective gear in order for people not to jump him. He did not say jump on him. He did not say that. Or to rush him. He, didn't he did say not that. say that. All right, now let's go to this. Uh, there's another part of your um, report here from that day where you said, when looking in the mirror, he saw another guy. Do you see that? Yes. The rest of that reads, and had a sense that something, comma, quote, a master power, end quote, had taken over, period. Do you see that? Yes. A master power is a phrase, I think you may have uh, already indicated this, appears uh, nowhere else in your notes from any period of time, right? Yes. And when he's referring to a master power, based on the way you've written this, he is talking about the person he sees in the mirror, correct? Do, do you read that one looking I, in the mirror? I, I read it, but I don't. Uh, this is not what it uh, what 
I intended uh, to convey. I, it was in the context that I asked him about why did he dye his hair uh, red, and he wasn't, you know, he, did, he said he doesn't know why he dyed his hair, but when I asked him, what is it? What caused you to dye your hair? I mean, you changed your appearance. He said, maybe to distance myself from him, from that person that he could see in the mirror. He is not me. So the person that he looked at the mirror with the red hair was not James Hall. Some separation, distancing himself from that, uh, uh, from that person. It was like another guy. And he had the sense at that time, it's not why just looking at the mirror, but at that time he had the sense that the word master power when following up with him was not a power that was, you know, uh, omnipotent power that was pushing him, but a strong power, a strong push, similar to the call for action, mobilize, uh, that has taken over, that is propelling him to move according to the mission, to his actions. You'd agree that the phrase, a master power, is one that he came up with, not you, right? Correct. And you'd also agree that that phrase not only doesn't exist anywhere else in your notes or any other conversation you've had with them, but you don't see it anywhere in the record of these 100,000 pages, right? Correct. So it only appears in your June 2013 report where you find him schizophrenic and sane. Is that fair? Action asked and answered. Overrule? Go ahead. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, that that phrase, a master power, exists nowhere in this case other than in your June 2013 report where you find him to be insane and schizophrenic. Fair? Correct. Now, you also know that Dr. Woodcock talked to him about such things and um, asked him about whether or not he had thoughts of control. And his answer was no. Do you recall that? Yes. And that was a statement he made four days after he walked into the theater to kill all those people, right? Yes. Now, uh, you get into uh, part two of your February 9th uh, meeting with the defendant. Yes. And one of the things you begin to flesh out here with him is that he is now telling you that the universe has no future and there is no reason for it to continue, correct? Yes. Now, you'd agree that that statement itself doesn't suggest the universe is coming to an end. He just doesn't think it should keep going. Fair? It is, it's a consistent statement. Yeah. The universe should not continue going. It's coming to an end. Well, no, when and something doesn't continue, it is, it's at the end. Well, and forgive me, the, the quote, though, here is, there is no reason for it to continue. Correct? Yes. yes. Then later, he says to you a quote that you attribute to him anyway that says, quote, no future for me means no future for the world, means death is better for all. Do you see that? Yes. First off, you'd agree that th this entire exchange about the world coming to an end and death is better for all, that, that appears nowhere else in uh, any of the mental health experts' reports or any of the other discovery in this case. You'd agree with that? Objection. Misstatement of the evidence. Overrule. Can you, can you repeat the question? Yeah, the, the quote, did you find it, no future for me means no future for the world, means death is better for all? Do you see yes. that? Yes. Yeah, that, that quote doesn't appear anywhere else in discovery, right? Not that quote, but similar words that there is no future, and that the death is upon us. Now your quote, appear. yeah, I'm sorry, your, your quote, and that's in quotes, in your notes, the quote was written one way, and then it looks like you went back and changed it. Can you find it in your notes? The notes of when? 
of that that second meeting that you had with him in February where you came up with the words no future for me means no future for the world means death is better for all do you see that I'm looking for it just a minute please The universe has no future and there is no reason to continue. He believed that other people feel the, se the way he did and that death is a rational step. No life for me equals no life for others. He was not angry. That's what you mean? No, ma'am. The quote that you wrote, which was in your notes, no future for me, equal sign, no future for the world, equal all want death. And then you scratched out all want and wrote is better for all after death. Do you see that? In my notes? Yes, ma'am. I don't see anything scratched out. I don't see. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. That's the cut. I don't know. I don't know the page, but may I show you what it yeah. looks like in my notes? Sure. Judge, I would like a page reference if I could. Well, he said he doesn't have the page, right? Do you have the page number, Mr. Brockler? I don't, Judge. I could go back through my notes. I kind of cut and pasted it without that, and I, and I apologize. Ah, That's the very this, last thing ah, you wrote last on it. You see that? Okay, I see. C can you tell Mr. King what page that is on your notes? Uh, on my notes, it's the last uh, page of visit to of uh, February 9, 13. Okay. In the afternoon, the last sentence, the last. You see it, right? Yeah. And the phrase, all want death, you have scratched out all want and have added is better off for all at the end of it. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Now, there's another portion um, in your notes where you talk about him in the laboratory experienced seeing a shadow that when he turned so, around was not there. Back to my report. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. Just one second, please. Yes, ma'am. We're still on February 9th in the afternoon, right? I think, I think so, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm there, page 11 on the top. Yes, ma'am, thank you. And you see that in there, correct? Yes. Now, there's no amount of probing that resulted in him telling you that those shadows at the time were dancing, right? Not at the time, no. Mm -hmm. Or that they had shadow swords or guns, correct? Correct. Nor that they were juggling shadow heads. Correct. In fact, towards the next part of that section, his other reference to shadows is that he saw them in his cell and he told you that he jumped off the bed expecting the shadow to catch him. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Now let's go to May, May 2nd, 2013. This will be your uh, last meeting with him before you write your report, correct? Yes. And it's also the meeting at which you have full access to the notebook based on what you told us previously, correct? Correct. Because you'd gotten it, boy, about three months earlier, almost February 13th. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Now, there's a paragraph that begins by the second term of high school freshman year. Do you see that? Yes. Now, you indicate here another quote, I suffer, other people suffer, all will be better off if everybody on earth dies, correct? Yes. Later on, you talk about him, hang on here, the, the shooting was impersonal. Can you find that sentence? 
I'm turning, turning the page. Yes, I found it. The last paragraph on pa paragraph before the last on page 12. And it says right after that, he says that he dressed differently for it, it being the shooting. Do you see that? Yes. And the dressing differently that you're referring to there is he wore body armor. Right? Yes. That, that's how he dressed differently. Correct? And he had the face, you know. The gas Other, mask? Gas mask, yes. We'll, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But that, mm -hmm. it's not like he put on different clothes than he normally wore. He was wearing the body armor to protect himself from the police, you thought? Yes. Okay. You then go on uh, after that to talk about he believed that his low self-value arise by incorporating the, quote, value of accomplishments and future potential of the people he will kill. Do you see that? Yes. First off, to be clear, when you talk to him about it, he never tells you anything like, I get one point per life, did he? At that time, I believe, let me see, uh, as you stated, I did have, is, uh, on, on, we are on May, we are on the May yes, second yes, interview, doctor. correct? Yep, yep. So I began to go over the report with him on the May 2nd interview, going through it a uh, first time, you know, more quickly, making sure that I understand the symbols, and then in the following interview, going over it again, putting some notes that I provided to you. So there was already in the notes, in, the, um, in his notebook, the symbols and the values of people and were those values just ones? Each person was worth one? Yes. Okay. Your quote in here, in May, is that the value of accomplishments and future potential of the people he will kill will come to him, correct? Correct. He does not tell you it is a one point per life sort of proposition, correct? Objection. Misstatement of the evidence. Overruled. Correct? Can you ask again, please? Yes. Yeah. He didn't tell you in that quote that he gets one point per life. Correct? Going over it for the first time, at that time, quickly, throughout date, I do not recall that he said it's one for one, but it's the value of people. Right. And the value is dependent upon things like uh, children are worth more because they have more future potential. You'd agree with that? Yes. Now, that's not in the notebook, right? It's not. It's my questioning. Right. And, and that doesn't actually appear in your report either, does it? It's on the note that I took. I'm sorry? It's on the note that I provided you with. The, the note? Yeah, from my notes on the notebook. Oh, I, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the notes that were provided to us a Sunday night of this past week. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. And we'll get to more of the notebook here in a moment. But in your report and in your notes on that report, you never once talk about the fact that he thinks it's a one point per life proposition, correct? Asked and answered. She just said it was in the notes turned over on Sunday. Now, this is a, a different question. This is specific to the notes and the report, so overrule. Go ahead, doctor. So, what, what can you point back to me? What is the question? Yeah, the question is, me? take a look at your notes and the report where you declare him to be insane and schizophrenic. You do not anywhere describe his transfer of value as being one point per life, correct? I believe that he did state that in, you know, in the calculate, in the drawing that he has made of that it's one, one life, but I did not 
write it down in the report as one per life. Instead, you wrote down value of accomplishments and future potential. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then you wrote down that he now realizes that, quote, this was crazy, end quote. Do you see that? Yes. And, and the way you described it with uh, Mr. King yesterday was that now he knows that other people think it's crazy, but he still believes it. Do you recall that exchange? Correct. That is not what your sentence reads in the report where you found him insane. Fair? It was his response to my question, Father Probing, is it, what do other people think about that? And he said, he realizes that other people will think that this was crazy. Oh, he still holds on to that those beliefs. Doctor, do you think that your report says he now realizes that other people will think this was crazy? That this was crazy in the eyes of other people. That that is not what your report says. This is what it means. I mean, it's a brief sentence. He now realizes that this was crazy, that the perception of other people, of what he has done, was crazy. He still holds on to those beliefs. Doctor, you agree that the paragraph that that punctuates there at the end has nothing to do with the perceptions of other people. It is his perceptions of why he did what he did. You agree with that? The sen Asked and answered. Overruled. Go ahead, doctor. The sentence before, or the, the context, the few sentences before were related to the self-value, to his delusions, that he will rise by incorporating the value and an accomplishment of other people. And my response was, what will other people think about it? My pushing on him was, what do other people think about it? Is this something that other people do? to increase the value, people are depressed, people are desperate in the way he was describing himself, and he's really, he's, he realizes that this was crazy in my eyes and in the eyes of other people, in the eye of anybody who will follow his belief system that to improve someone's self-value, you kill people. Doctor, you would agree with me that that entire couple paragraphs of exchange that you had explaining that is absolutely absent from any note or your report from June of 2013. Do you agree with that? I agree that my notes are brief and the response is brief. And when you ask, you to, when you ask me to elaborate, I provide you with the context and the details to the best of my ability. So when you wrote the phrase that's actually in here, the one you knew would be going to attorneys and the judge and potentially the jury, it reads, he believed that his judge, low I'm self value. Man, we approach. Okay. The objection is overruled.
But Mr. Brother, you uh, should proceed as we discussed at the bench. Um, you, why don't you repeat your question? I will. I will, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, the, the quote, as it is written in your report, that you knew when you wrote it would be considered by people like in this room, correct? You agree with that? Yes. Reads, he believed that his low self-value will rise by incorporating the value of accomplishments and future potential of the people he will kill. He now realizes that this was crazy. Correct? This is what it reads. And anybody reading that would conclude that he now believes that prior statement about his belief was crazy. You'd agree with that? Objection calls for speculation. Overruled? Go ahead, ma'am. You agree that's the way it reads? What you read, you read correctly. But what I add to it is that uh, probing him and asking him what will other people think about it. Other people will think that this was crazy. He realizes that other people think that this was crazy behavior. Does he accept that? Based on the evaluation and further information, he still adheres to the same belief, the same delusion. D Doctor, do you uh, agree then that looking at it now as we are and reading it uh, the way you wrote it, that it is now, in your opinion, misleading to what you actually intended it to be? I'm going to object to the question as argumentative. Overruled. Go ahead, Doctor. Do you think it is misleading in the way it is written? Oh, I will not call it misleading. I, I will call it that it provided information that when somebody reads it within, without additional information on the context, might conclude that uh, Mr. Holmes was sitting with me and considering all components of what he has done and was saying, you know, what I did is really crazy. Understood. It's, it's a little bit different, but I can understand. I don't see it as misleading on my part. Maybe not explaining sufficiently, mm -hmm. uh, being brief, yes, but not misleading. I do not intend to mislead the court. Okay. There's another section here where you say, his nihilistic delusions that the world was coming to an end became bizarre as he came to believe that he was commanded to act and that others would be grateful to him for helping them die before the inevitable catastrophe. Do you see that? Are we on the next page? Uh, maybe, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'd... Is it on? Wait, wait, I'll find it's part, it. It's part of your conclusion, I, yeah, I believe. Yeah, I, I remember it. Yeah, it's part of your conclusion. I, I remember the words. So, Th uh, 13, ma'am? Uh, 13? Yes, ma'am. I found it. Okay. Fourth line from the bottom. Thank you. Now tell us when you explored with him, what was the, how you characterize it, the inevitable catastrophe? The world coming to an end, not in apocalyptic terms. He did not use the word catastrophe. I used it. Why did you use it? The world coming to an end is how catastrophic. Is, how is the world going to come to an end? He didn't know the world will come to an end but he believed that the world is going to come to an end, that life equal death, and that there's no purpose for the world to continue, and the world is going to come to an end. That's part of his nihilistic delusion, that the world is going to come to an end. Did he tell you when? What? Did he tell you when this inevitable catastrophe was going to happen? There was no date on it, no. Did you ask him? Yes, but there was no specific date. It was not it's going to come to an end on, you know, uh, June 20 or... No. You'd it, agree it that... It has a pervasive sense that the world is coming to an end. And with this, the associated firm and fixated belief that everybody is going to die, life is worthless, and other people are going to die too. I called it catastrophe. 
he did not use the word catastrophe. It's not in, clo it's not in quotation. You'd agree, too, that he does not repeat that nihilistic delusion of a catastrophe or the world coming to an end to any other mental health provider you're aware of. Correct? Um, I Objection, believe misstatement of the evidence. Go ahead, doctor. You don't remember him yeah, telling that to anyone else? Yeah, I, I think that he is talking about the end of the world. To who? I, you know, I can't tell you specifically, but he is talking about that his life is meaningless and that the world will come, uh, the world will come to an end. You believe he told one of the other uh, psychiatrists we've heard from that the world was going to come to an end? I say it's possible. I don't remember, but uh, definitely repeated it to me multiple times, mm -hmm. and it was part of his delusions. You also wrote down that he, uh, he did not believe that he was, I'm sorry, his perception that he was causing no real damage to the people he killed. He fully believed that the victims were not substantively harmed because they were bound to die anyway, correct? Yes. But to be clear, there was no point at which he did not know that he was taking their lives, correct? He knew, yes, he knew that he was killing people. He never thought he was shooting demons or just wounding people. He was intending to kill and knew he was engaged in killing behavior. Is Objection. That, that question evades the province of the jury. Uh, rephrase the question. Doctor, you would agree that he uh, had the capacity to know that he was killing people and that he had the capacity to intend to kill those people, correct? No. Okay. Now, one of the things you told us earlier was that in your May 2nd, 2013 visit, you went over the Gmail chat that he had with uh, Miss Dada. Do you recall that? Let me check the date. Yes. Okay. Can you look in your notes and tell us where you indicate that you had a conversation with him about that Gmail chat? Or if you think it's in your report, I'll take that. I believe, I believe, if this is what you're referring to, at the bottom of page six, if that's what you're referring to, once verbalized homicidal ideation to ex-girlfriend and psychiatrist, he knew he had to act, call for action, no way out. Now, that's it. That's fair. That, that is what you believe is your reference to having reviewed the Gmail chat with him in detail, is the phrase, once verbalized homicidal ideation to ex-girlfriend, is that fair? Judge, yeah. I'm going to object to the form of the question is, that is what you believe. Go ahead, doctor. Is and that right? That there, and also uh, on uh, my notes of August 5th, 2014. No, no, doctor, I'm only asking you about May of 2013, before you declared him insane and schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. Your singular yes. reference to what you believe is the Gmail chat is this once, ver in notes, in notes, mm -hmm. once verbalized homicidal ideation to ex-girlfriend. Fair? Yes. And psychiatrist. Yes. Correct? There is no other discussion that you have with him about the language that he used or any other parts of that G-chat, correct? No other. 
Yes. In fact, the phrase human capital doesn't show up in there anywhere, does it? Yes. And the phrase that you used wasn't he G-chatted his girlfriend, it was verbalized, right? Yes. No other exploration of that Gmail chat with him prior to you declaring him insane and schizophrenic in June of 2013. No, I did explore it with him, but if you ask me, did I document here in my writing? The answer is no. Same as I replied previously, but I did explore it with him before my report. But it doesn't appear anywhere. Correct. Okay. You also indicated in May of 2013 that he told you he had no plans to flee. You recall that? That's what he said. Now, um, you explored with him all the steps he took to cover his tracks to set himself up to flee. You agree with that? Yes. That appears nowhere in your report or your notes prior to declaring him insane or schizophrenic, right? was taken into consideration. It's not in my notes. Taken into consideration? The fact that he had studs, that he had with him in the uh, car, didn't use, yes. What else? Did he have cash on him? Did he have money? I, I believe he did, but I don't remember how much money. I believe he did. Do you, um, one of the other things you don't explore with him, and again, maybe I should rephrase that. One of the things you don't document ever discussing with him at all is why he stopped shooting in the theater. I did. He jammed. That doesn't appear in any notes or report either, does it? Yeah, I mean, it's documented. Where? Not in mine, but it's documented in the evidence that is available. But th this is a conversation that you had with him? Yes. Does it feel like to you, doctor, that had this been videotaped, we wouldn't have all these questions? Into we having these questions. Sustained. Do you feel like a lot of these questions would have been easier to answer if this thing had been videotaped? Perhaps I think that there would have been other action, other questions. You're not clear, your accent is not clear, can you repeat this word or that word? And that's the nature of the legal process, for you to ask me all the questions so that you can, we can present to the court the entire, both sides of the story. I think you'd have had other questions for me. Oh, thank you. One of the things, though, is that you, even though you had this exchange with him about not fleeing, the only thing that makes it into your report is his claim that he did not intend to flee, correct? Correct. That's, I'm summarizing what he told me, that That's he right. did and not intend to flee. And you are not documenting in there any evidence that corroborates or contradicts any of his statements that he gave to you in that report, correct? Correct? Correct. Knowing that it is available to the court, I mean, you're not going to take what I say without all the entire story of what happened, all the evidence that is available that I've reviewed. This was his response to me. Did I believe that? No, I did not, because I knew about everything else that happened at that time that is available. I mean, it's part of the, it's part of the record, so I did not repeat it. In these notes that we received uh, from the notebook that you gave to us, uh, or you turned over on Sunday past, uh, on page 31, do you see that? There's notes you take as you go through certain things with him from the notebook? Do you see that? Let me find the page, just one second. Page 29. Yes. And you're taking these notes inside this copy of the notebook contemporaneous with your conversations with the defendant, I presume. Yes. And what he tells you is killing others is not fair to them. Correct. Correct. He tells you that he doesn't think he could have gone through with this if he knew the people that he was killing. Correct? Correct. Even if it was going to do them a favor too, correct? Correct. He also tells you that he knows that life is priceless. Correct. Correct. 
and, and I, I don't know if I can read it, but the other part he told you is if he had if he had found some value in his own life or purpose, then um, he would not have followed through with this. Do you recall um, that? I'm looking for it. Yeah, I'm looking for the notes too. <laughs> It will not make sense to kill if life was priceless. You mean yeah, in the yeah. symbols of in, That's what he told you. in the yeah in the symbols of infinity is priceless infinity the eighth this symbol that life is priceless. Thank you. Zero life is nothing. Thank you. And then the mission arbitrary value is kill one it is one. This is when yep. he specifically stated that one is one. You write down there, if life, he tells you, if life was meaningful, it would be priceless and it would not make sense to kill, correct? Correct. And also just, I might have omitted it, if I may go back, he tells me, if kills one, then one can increase meaningfulness, meaning, meaningfulness by killing by kill, and this is the sign of one. Uh, the value of one increases his life by one. So it's one to one. It, I go back to yeah. the question that you asked me before. Yes, I understand. You showed me this. Doctor, he didn't tell you that until you sat down, sat down with him with the notebook many months after you generated your June 2013 report, correct? Objection. This no. states the testimony. Overruled. Go ahead, doctor. I'm checking my date, please. Sure. Look uh, for November of 2013. Okay. I got the book, no, the notebook on February 13, 2013. And on May 2nd visit, I began to go over it uh, with him in more detail. And uh, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Doctor, no, nowhere in your notes, nowhere in the report, do you indicate that you went over the notebook with the defendant? Correct. It is indicated, I believe. Let me check, please. Sure. Okay. May I address the question yes, that you raised? Yep. I began to go over it with him and putting my notes down. I followed up on, as indicated in my notes, I didn't do it at one time. I followed up on November 18th visit and it's written in my note. 
He was cooperative and examined with me the notebook as I was sitting next to him. Doctor, you are reading from a note from November of 2013, correct? Yeah. There's no detailed um, laying out of the notebook that you went through with him prior to that, correct? I went over the note, as I said, I started going over the notebook and at that time I was sitting on the other side of the table for him, from him and ended him a page by page, but it was awkward. So on the next visit, I sat next to him, asked permission to sit next to him, and we sat together and I put it there and that's why I documented it. But I started going over it before my report. But not documented in your report or the notes, correct? Correct. Now, there's a couple things I want to ask you about that report that you generated with the things that we've discussed. Now, inside the notebook, you probably noticed that the defendant uses the phrase or word murder or murderer a number of times. Do you recall that? Yes. Do you know how many times he uses it? I didn't count. Eight. Do you agree with that or you don't disagree? I mean, I, I trust you. Do you know how many times you used the term murder in your notes or writing your report before you declared him insane or schizophrenic and schizophrenic? I don't believe I used the word uh, murder. Correct. You used it zero times. Um, and you don't disagree with that, mm -hmm. right? Correct? Correct. Inside the notebook, the defendant uses the word hate or hatred eight times. You don't disagree with that, do you? I trust you. Do you know how many times you use the term hate or hatred in your notes or your report? Objection, uh, irrelevant. Overruled. Go ahead, doctor. I believe, uh, without searching for it, that I did uh, ask him about uh, hatred of people. And he said that he did maybe a couple of times. And he said that uh, there is no hatred. At one time he said maybe a little, but there's no hatred. He was not motivated by hatred. And it was in the context of did you kill the people because you hate people. And this is something that has come up with others. To me, little was the only thing it disclosed. It does not say hatred for humankind to me. That, that's what you think you wrote in your report. Is that fair? Do you have on the page, it can save us time, of where I wrote about it? Oh, ma'am. Or what? I did, I know that I used the word that it denied or didn't say it was for hatred, but, you know, I don't, let me check. Mr. Brockler, would, would this be a good time to take our afternoon break? Sure, Judge. Yeah. All right, members of the jury, let's go ahead and take our afternoon oh, yeah. break. Uh, please make sure you uh, abide by all my admonishments during the break, and I'll see you back here at 3.30. All right, let's go ahead and take our afternoon break. I'll see everyone back at 3.30. The court will be in recess. Thank you. Thank you guys.